You know, if it is your desire to so serve, I believe that God is able to help us so structure our time so that we can give back to communities just like our schools. What fortune lies beyond the stars Those dazzling heights too fast to climb I got so high to fall so far But I found heaven is lost my glow My heart bleeding, my soul bleeding I found my life when I laid it down Word falling, spirit soaring. I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. What treasure waits within your scars? This gift of freedom, gold. I bought the world and sold my heart You traded heaven to happy again My heart beating, my soul breathing I found my life when I laid it down Upward falling, spirit soaring I touched 
you can feel like there's a family sense. And it's one reason why I really like Oak Ridge is because there's always people around that will accept you and love you. Hi, my name is Manu Waldasadik. I'm currently at Deer Lake, and this is my story. Pathfinder has probably been one of the biggest influences for me and Oak Ridge. I like being more of a behind the scenes guy, just not really in the spotlight, but still doing things that people not necessarily notice, but people would appreciate. A chance to get baptized when I was younger, but I guess it didn't just, like, it didn't feel right at that time. And then, then a couple months ago, I guess, Pastor Kumar asked me to do a few Bible studies. Uh, I thought, like, yeah, this is the right time to do it. And then I guess when I went to the Berman Transcend Youth Summit, and they had, like, a baptism call, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, but I want to do it at home, which is Oak Ridge. My family never really pressured me to get, like, baptized. It's just like, oh, yeah, do it when you're ready. And that's... That's been helpful because it's like, because it's my own choice, I guess. And it, I really appreciate it. Like, them being there for me whenever I like need them, but also letting me also like make my decisions, I guess. I guess my experiences that show that Jesus is real and I need him in my life just to get like get through life and it's not really just me it's like it's it's about me going with him and trying to be a better person with him I spend time through God through like, like prayer and conversation and just like setting aside like this amount of time but and constantly throughout the day god is still with you even when you think you're abandoned or even when you feel alone My name is John Sheehy, I'm 13 and I'm from Australia. My dog is a girl and she is a year old and is a Labrador cross with a retriever. The thing I love most about my dog is that she's so cute and she's really nice to people. I like how she's energetic. I decided to get baptized off to Peru. We were on a missions trip and we had to build smokeless fire stoves to put in the houses. I talked to the people there and after that it changed my heart, so I really wanted to get baptized. I like rock climbing because um, it's a challenge and when you complete it, you feel really accomplished and good. Some people that I look up to is my brother and my dad, because my brother is really nice to everyone and he's going to be a pilot someday. So, And my dad is a really good spiritual leader and I look up to him. 
every night he does worship with me and when I go to bed he prays for me and I really want to be like my dad and get baptized and my nana and granddad are here so I want to get baptized when they're here. Jesus means to me personally someone like a best friend that you can talk to. You can tell him all about what you want to do when you're older and just talk to him and let him know stuff about you. And, you know, like with a friend, you get to know them better, they get to know you better, and then your relationship is stronger. So that's what I want it to be like with me and Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to OAC this morning. We are so glad that you've joined us, whether you are here in the building or whether you are joining us online. You know, our desire this morning is to really take you on a journey to experience how much God loves you. And you're going to just see this through this theme throughout our worship this morning. God's desire just to know you, to let you know how much he cares, regardless of how great the week's been or maybe not so great. You know, he just desires your praises. So let's just have a word of prayer this morning and uh, get our worship started. Father God, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to worship you. We thank you for the knowledge that you pursue us time and time again, that you desire to have an intimate relationship with each and every one of us. We pray that you will just come into this room this morning, that you will fill our hearts and that your Holy Spirit will be ever present. May every praise be taken and lifted up to you this morning. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Stand with us as we sing, You Make Me Brave. Your love. 
going to be teaching you a new song this morning and I'm sure there's maybe a few thinking no not another new song but this is one that we really feel that is just so powerful it says you called my name and I ran out of that grave there are just so many things that bind us that hold us back from living the life that God intends for each and every one of us and this song is all about sort of like he's already he's already paid that price you know, break down those walls that separate you and God. Break down those walls that stop you from enjoying the fullness of life that He desires for you because He's already conquered the world. So we can jump out of those graves. So we're going to sing the first few verses and chorus, and then we're going to go right back to the top and sing it all together. Sounds like a plan? Awesome. Let's worship together this morning. It was my tune 
chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open because when you call my name Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his 
through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before him. Because of his love, God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters. This was his pleasure and purpose. Know this, God, your God is God indeed, a God you can depend on. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. Amen.
Let's sing that with our hearts. And oh, how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. We are his portion. And we are his portion. we stand here together and we feel the Holy Spirit in this room, just open up your heart to be loved completely by God. You know, He desires nothing more than to be a part of each and every one of our lives. No conditions asked, there's no catch, just the fact that He loves you from before you were born you were the apple of his eye nothing you do nothing you've done nothing you will do can separate you from the love of God isn't that a wonderful thought but the thing is you've got to accept it you've got to believe it otherwise walls form and barriers form and God just wants to break them down he just he just wants you and me and sometimes I just think God, I'm sorry that I don't let you in and let you love me the way you want to love me. Because I'm only hurting myself and there is enough hurt and pain in this world. But he's a wonderful God and he's a faithful God and he keeps pursuing and chasing. And you know, God, I am so grateful that you continue to pursue me every single day because I am so unworthy. I am not a perfect person at all, but still he loves me. Oh, how my God loves me. And he loves you. And we're gonna sing to him. We're gonna sing to him one more time because he is beautiful. He is worthy of all our praises. Even if you're struggling to accept it, sing it. Sing it until you believe it. Sing it until you see God's love manifested in your life in such an unfathomable way that it's just overflowing and you just cannot believe that this this is who your God is and this is what your life looks like because of who he is and his love for you what a beautiful name what a powerful name what a mighty name is the name of Jesus
Amen. Would you please kneel with me in prayer? Dear Father, we have become far too accustomed to these lowlands. Please call us out of these valleys of worry, of darkness, and shame. Forgive us 
for our unfaithfulness. Forgive us for our complacency and lift us up, please, into your love. We now ask that your presence fill this church and our hearts and with the presence, the promise that you have of a perfect peace that will claim our hearts and minds. We also ask for the power, the power of Jesus. We ask for the power to be your hands and feet and to spread your love within our community and around our community. May your presence, your peace, and your power fill us today. You are Jesus. What a beautiful name the lion and the lamb. We humbly come before your throne, but we come with a boldness and a confidence that your love exceeds all that we can imagine. Thank you, God. Amen. I'm wondering if there are six to nine-year-olds here today who would help me out with both collecting a children's offering and then joining Miss Eileen in the library for story time. So if you would like to go to story time, I'm going to make you a deal. First, we're going to trade. You're going to come forward and help me take up an offering collection that is for kids' ministry here at OAC. So at this time, if you're six to nine years old and have feet that can carry you, come up here because I can't run around and find you all in the benches. Perfect. Great. Just have a seat and I would love to offer a special prayer of blessing on you and this offering before I dismiss you to story time. You guys can trade if you want a different color. Thanks, Micah, for helping out. All right. Blue is popular. How about, oh, how about red to match your shirt? No more six to nine-year-olds. I know we have more kids. You want to trade? You're happy. Oh, extra one. All right. Wow, you guys look beautiful today. I want to thank you for being here and joining us in church. And I know there's a special story time program prepared for you. But let's just bow our heads and fold our hands and ask God's blessing upon the offering and upon you. Father God, um, what a beautiful morning. What a beautiful day to come and be in your house. I thank you that um, your house is a house of prayer for all people, old and young, rich and poor, no matter what, what our background is, you invite us all to be here and worship you. Bless the children and these families that they represent. Bless the offering that they collect. And may we um, use these funds, not just for the kids within your church, but to reach out to the kids and the families within our neighborhood. Bless them and these resources. We pray in your holy name. And all my friends said... Amen. So as you head down the aisle to the library, please make sure those little baskets get passed around and say thank you for the offering. So this morning we're starting a new series, a new teaching series that's going to take us all the way to Easter. And of course at Easter, uh, we are not celebrating chocolate and bunnies. We are celebrating one of the greatest moments in history where God who loved the world so much gave his one and only son to die on our behalf and for our sake. And so in preparation of that uh, semi-climax of the story, we're going back to the beginning. We're going back to look at some of these prophecies that we find throughout the Bible, some of these hints and symbols that foreshadow who God is, who Jesus is, and how he will come and what he will do. And it's um, confirming to me when I study the Bible that the first three chapters in Genesis and the last three chapters in Revelation are so beautifully bookending this story where Jesus is interwoven and all the pages in between. 
And so hopefully by revisiting some of these prophetic symbols, some that are familiar and known to you, maybe some that are lesser known, it will reconfirm your confidence in the history of Jesus and your confidence in the character of God and the nature of who he is. Oh, it would help if I find the clicker in my back pocket and turn it on. So the title of today's message is FOMO and Fur Coats. <clears throat> now, some of you are squinting your eyes already and scratching your heads what FOMO is. You can simply turn to anyone under the age of 30. They could probably fill you in on what FOMO is. Anyone? Yes, the fear of missing out. <clears throat> FOMO has existed for centuries, and yet it has become a new term or a more prevalent term in today's society, and even in psychoanalysis, as, as doctors and professionals are recognizing just how debilitating and how affected people can become with the anxiety, with the worry, with the concern that something else is happening without them being involved and partaking in it. That everybody else is having a better time, a better experience, more exciting, more interesting, a richer life. Now in my parents' generation, it's not that they didn't feel those feelings when they came home from work and put their feet up and wondered about were their classmates, were their peers uh, from high school feeling the same thing? They could only wonder until the next 10-year reunion and find out as you compare your lives with your peers. But now, social media is directly tied to the rise of FOMO because at our fingertips, we don't just compare ourselves to the people we see in front of us, but we literally have access to compare ourselves to millions of other people's lives. And the thing about social media is while it can be very connecting, we can be reunited and stay in touch with our, our loved ones no matter where they're taken in the world, it can also deepen our tendency for judgmentalism and self-criticism. Because very soon those pictures of, of the beach or of somebody's perfectly poured latte don't inspire in us a sense of comfort, but actually science shows that they deepen our feelings of despair in comparison as we realize what we're missing out on. So you might suffer from FOMO if you hate finding out that your friends have done something without you, that it really bothers you and sticks with you. Or if you're feeling um, anxious or a sense of anxiety when you can't check in and, and review what your friends are posting about, what they're talking about. Also, a sign could be that you have to be in on all of those in-jokes. And if somebody makes a reference and you're not up to speed with it, it starts to really um, nag at you and eat away at you. Or if you feel compelled to check in on social media, even while on vacation, you just can't take a break from it. A couple of other scenarios. Say you're sick. You're really sick and get the flu. And you find out that a bunch of your friends and coworkers have plans to go out, and originally you were going to join them, but now you find yourself sick. Do you A, just stay in bed at home? Do you B, drug yourself up so you can go out and enjoy the event with them, uh, you know, muddled by Sudafed or whatever? Do you C, try and convince that group of friends they have to postpone those plans. They can't go through with it tonight. They should, you know, be much better if they just put it off for a week so that you can join them. Or do you try and convince one or two of those friends to forego the group event and stay and come and comfort you and play nurse to you? If your tendency is anything but to just suffer it out alone, you're starting to connect with what FOMO is. If your coworkers start talking about this TV show and they're all excitedly swapping stories and their responses to it, 
and you don't really know what they're talking about. You haven't seen that TV show. If you are either compelled to run back to your desk and start Googling it and looking at the episode guide on Wikipedia, or if you make plans for that night to binge and catch up on the entire episode, the whole season, or if you just fake your way into the conversation, laughing at the, the in-jokes and throwing in a few words because you don't want to be perceived as the only one in the office who doesn't know what this show is. Or if you simply say different strokes for different folks and shrug it off. Only the last option means that you are totally free of FOMO. This is the story of Instagram. <laughs> you start off, just want to check out some cool pics. You want to see if there's anything funny posted that's going to lighten your mood. What's Peter Paul posted today? That always makes me smile. Oh, look, there's the beach. Marla's in Hawaii. Oh, that looks so nice. <laughs> then I start to think, I really want to be there right now instead of in the snow and the rain and the dreariness of Vancouver. And then I start thinking, why can't I be there right now? Why not me? Don't I deserve to be back on that beach? <gasps> ah. This is the story of Instagram. So again, studies have shown that this is becoming a real danger because while there is some positive aspects to the connectivity, we know that people are more likely to prevent the best side of themselves. They're more likely to post that perfect dish at a restaurant than the flop that they created at home. They're more likely to post that picture of the beach than they are of the trash that's littering their streets, unless they want to post it with a beautiful Instagram filter and inspiring quote so people can marvel at their creativity and insights. You see, social media gives us the illusion, and that's the key word, it's an illusion, a deception, that something better is always happening to someone else somewhere else. And the lower that your own need satisfaction, the lower your own life satisfaction, the higher your feelings of FOMO. And actually, they're now it, saying that um, it, research is showing young men are actually experiencing higher levels and more intense levels of FOMO than, than women. In Christianese, we know that FOMO, by other names, we call it covetousness. <laughs> We call it envy, we call it greed, we call it idolatry, we can even call it Sabbath breaking. And I believe that FOMO is where it all begins, that Eve was the first person to experience FOMO. You can read along with me in Genesis chapter 3 and see for yourself. Genesis chapter 3 follows a beautiful account of the creation story where the triune God has collaborated to speak life and beauty into this world. And he simply gave one instruction for his children that he put in that Garden of Eden, in that paradise. And that was to avoid one tree. One tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and he gave them the warning, the consequences, for if you eat it, you will die. God hid nothing from them. And yet, one day, Eve finds herself wandering through this garden, approaching this tree, and she's captivated, not just by the beauty of the tree, but by a mysterious, compelling creature that lives within it. Genesis chapter 3, she encounters what is referred to as a serpent. Although we have prophetic insight that says this was not the snake that we recognize today, but a most beautiful, elegant, um, beguiling creature. And in her discussion with the snake, 
she explains, you know, I got to I got to keep my distance here because this is the one tree, this is the one place that I shouldn't dwell, I shouldn't linger, I shouldn't entertain the thought of of being around this tree. Because God has warned me, if I touch this fruit, I'm going to die. And the snake says to her, no, you will not die. When you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman sees the tree and its fruit are good for food, for beauty and wisdom. For this creature that's dwelling in this tree, touching this fruit, presumably consuming it, is intelligent, it's gorgeous, and it's satisfied. So here Eve is stricken with FOMO. Look at what I'm missing out. The snake is promising me something better, that there's something more that I have to attain. And it's the driving deception that leads her to accept a piece of fruit from the serpent. And as he places it in her hands, he reminds her of the very words that she told him. Didn't your God say, even if you touch it, you will die? But she's holding it. She doesn't notice anything different. It feels nice. It's very enticing. And this to me is proof that fruit fondling was the first gateway drug. There is such a thing as a slippery slope. And the deeper we slide, the harder it is to climb back out. What's your gateway drug? It's some type of fruit fondling, I'm sure. And so Eve takes the fruit and she takes a bite. She passes it on to her husband. And in that moment, they suddenly felt the shame of their nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You see, some people might think, well, that's weird. Like, were they just running around um, naked in the garden, totally naked? And this was true then. What the serpent told them is actually the truth, that their eyes were open, like some part of their brain just switched on, and they understood what nakedness was. Instead, I would suggest that what they were wearing, what they were clothed in as they um, dwelt within the garden, as they made a home there, were robes of light, robes of God's righteousness. It's not explicitly there in the Genesis passage, but it's implied throughout the Bible. And as we interpret any text, as we study God's word, every piece of it must be held in the context of the Genesis to Revelation story. We can't be at risk of just trying to understand one single line, one single sentence, without seeing the bigger picture. And in the bigger picture, we know that when Moses meets with God and talks with God face to face, his entire countenance begins to glow brightly. So much so that he has to actually wear a veil when he comes off of Mount Zion and needs to talk and relay the message to people. In Isaiah chapter 61, and some of you know I have a holy crush on Isaiah. He is the first person that I want to meet other than Jesus when I get to heaven. I just could drink in his words every single day. But Isaiah 61, he says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with his robe of righteousness, just as the groom decks himself with garlands and the bride adorns herself with jewels. Later in Isaiah 64, he says, for all of us have become like the one who was unclean and our righteous deeds are filthy garments. All of us wither like leaves and our iniquities like the wind will be blown away. All of us are like leaves withering. That's a reference, I believe, to the initial experience of lacking a robe of righteousness. 
And in trying to cover up that shame, they take what seems available to them as a good idea, and they take some fig leaves, and they sew them together. And the original text, in the original language, it says to make an apron. So you know how kind of skimpy and you know minimal and just essential coverage you get from an apron. Adam and Eve had no understanding of death at this point or decay. They have no idea that the fig leaves themselves will soon wilt and wither. They didn't have language to know those, that terminology and understand it. But we have in their reaction a reflection and a mirror of what our reaction always is when we come face to face with our darkness, with our demons, with our errors. We just try and patch it up, hold things together. We try and deny it or we try and escape it. I'm really appreciating uh, the Freedom Session course that we're doing here at church, which I helps us identify our drugs of choice. And it puts within the list of ways that we escape and deny and um, avoid facing the darkness in our hearts. It, it puts in that list things like judgmentalism, righteous works, perfectionism, workaholism. It's more than just taking a drink. It's more than just binging on Netflix. We all have our drugs of choice that, like those fig leaves, can't sustain and cover our pain for very long. As soon as the power goes out, as soon as the beverage is consumed, as soon as the sugar high runs out, our covering is wilted and withered. It's insufficient. And so we take and we look for what's that next fig leaf that's going to cover this up for me. But this is the good news that Jesus approaches, God approaches, and he offers them something far more sufficient than fig leaves. Genesis 3, um, verse 9, the Lord God comes and calls to man, saying, where are you? because they've hidden themselves. They realize that uh, it's pretty obvious wearing these aprons of leaves that something has gone wrong. They feel it. I'm sure they feel the, the air temperature that was once so pleasant and comfortable now has this eerie chill about it. And so they, they hide for cover. Just like um, children do when they know that they've gotten their hands in that cookie jar and they shouldn't have and the door starts to open they try and disguise and hide it and cover it up they're hiding themselves and i think this speaks to god's character that he doesn't immediately come down with a lightning bolt or spring up in front of them going oh you did it no he calls to them and he says children where are you what have you done this is the God who knows exactly where they are and what they have done. And yet, he wants the relationship. He wants the dialogue. He wants them to take ownership and fess up and admit the truth of what has happened. And instead, we see in Adam's response that he's not just shielding himself with fig leaves, but he's shielding himself by casting the blame elsewhere. That woman that you gave me, gave me this fruit. And Eve takes it, the blame, and she passes it on to the serpent. Well, it was that serpent. He told a very compelling lie. It doesn't matter if we are innocently deceived by a convincing lie. Our downfall doesn't come from listening innocently to what seems to be a reasonable logic. Instead, our downfall comes from not trusting that our God loves us and gives us instructions for our benefit and our gain. And so God hears them out. He hears out the casting of blame, the justification that they give for why they have erred and what they have done. 
He even listens as they hold the blessings that God gave them against him. God has blessed them with the garden, blessed them with each other, blessed them with free will and choice, blessed them with truth. And yet they take that and they shove it back in God's face. And kindly, God explains what's going to happen next. When we read further in Genesis 3, 13 and 14, we see that God starts to respond to the serpent. Some of you in your Bibles might have subheadings, and sometimes the subheading reads, God pronounces a curse. But I want to be very careful with that kind of identification and language. Because as you read, you see that, yes, God does speak to the serpent, saying the serpent will now be cursed. Now the snake, which may have had wings, may have had limbs to pass uh, Eve, that piece of fruit, now it's condemned to slither on the ground on its belly and be feared of all the creatures. And still today, we have this innate instinct to be disgusted and creeped out by snakes. And so there is a curse pronounced on the serpent. But as we read on, I do not really find a curse pronounced on Adam and Eve. Rather, what I'm reading is the consequences of sin. For God says, I will put enmity, hostility between the snake and the woman, between its offspring and her offspring. Your son, her son, will strike your head or stomp your head while you strike at its heel, at his heel. <clears throat> And to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. You're in pain, you bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your man, and he will rule over you. And to the man, he says, you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded, do not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you, and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life with thorns and thistles brought forth, you will eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to ground, for out of it you were taken. You were dust, and to dust you will return. So the curses that I read in this passage are against the serpent and the ground. But for Adam and Eve, what I see is a revelation of the consequences of sin. And this is very core to my understanding of theology, is that God does not need to punish because sin is self-punishing. Sin itself is the punishment. Sin itself is destruction. Sin itself is a breakdown and damage and separation of everything that God intended to be good. Our relationships, our environment, our connection to him. God does not really need to add punishment when we start to feel the weight of destruction and separation. And so God is just speaking the truth. He's speaking prophecy in this moment. He's saying that this are, these are the wages of sin, that dying begins now. Death begins now. The end is coming because of this. But right there before any of those pronouncements of what will happen, the damage that will be done, don't miss the prophetic promise of Jesus. Because in this verse, Genesis 3.15, he speaks of a snake crusher to come. From the seed of woman, from one of her descendants, one of her sons, will be the one who stomps out the snake for good. But the snake does strike the heel. That hero, that rescuer, that champion will be injected with toxic, deadly venom. But it's just a wound. Thankfully, the promise is that the son will be victorious. This also ties in to that verse that makes people a little bit touchy. What is this um, revelation that a woman's desire will be for her man and he will rule over you? 
This is a description of the consequences of sin. And yet, if you go back to the original text, I know a lot of your Bibles you're reading, your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. But if you go back to the original text, the word is yish, it's man. Your desire will be for a man to rule over you, to oversee things. This word rule is the same word that God uses when he says the sun will rule the day and the moon will rule the night. It's an illuminating, protective, life-giving kind of rule. And what's more telling about understanding that passage is Genesis 4.1, when Eve finally conceives and bears her first son, Cain, she says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. It is the same word that your Bibles are often translating as husband in verse 16, would she say, here, I have produced a husband, a gift from the Lord. No, she's saying, I have the man, the gift from the Lord. See, verse 15, verse 16, and Genesis 4-1 are all talking about the same prophetic symbol of Jesus the Savior. Sometimes the word yish in the Bible can also be interpreted as the champion, a great man. And so this is the promise of a redemption plan, a rescue plan that's already knit into God's um, admonishment of his first children, is that you will have all of this pain in bearing children. You will go through agony, not just in childbirth, but in raising them. You will know my agony. You will know my heartbreak as a parent when the kids that you desire the best for turn on their own and follow their own ways and go off course. You will feel the anguish like no one else. You will have sleepless nights worrying about the future of your children. This is the result of sin that we don't have confidence and trust in each other, not even in our own flesh and blood. But your desire will be for a great man, a champion who will rule. In this passage, I believe we have the first foreshadowing of this understanding of Jesus as both lion and lamb, the king lion and the sacrificial lamb. And when she has her first son, she is so excited because living in sin those first few months or years has been horrific. Never would they have, could they have imagined um, just what sin and decay and death meant. And so when she has her firstborn, she's excited. Here he is already, the promise. He must be the promised one that I'm awaiting, the man from the Lord. We understand that this passage points to Jesus from uh, verse 21 as well. So I want to take note of this, that the Lord himself made garments for Adam and Eve out of skin he clothed them. Jesus, or God, recognizes that their aprons of leaves are insufficient to protect their modesty and to protect their dignity. And after speaking this death decree of what's to come, God himself, with his own hands, takes the first life ever on planet Earth. He takes this little perfect lamb, white, snowy wool, and to the horror of Adam and Eve, he slits its throat and he skins it. And he shows them how to tan the hide, something that will more permanently endure and protect them from the elements. In doing so, God points to Emmanuel, God with us. God is saying, I am with you. I am one with you in suffering the agony of death. God does not order them to take the life. 
I believe this is such a picture and a revelation of the character of God that he began to suffer with us on the very first day we sinned. His suffering did not just begin with Jesus and the temptation in the wilderness. His suffering began right on day one of sin. And Jesus did so not to show or prove that he is a bloodthirsty God, but he did so to prove that he has a bleeding heart and that it is only the shedding of blood, his own son's blood, that can cover their sins. He did it to prove that he was willing to take that upon himself while at the same time illustrating the symbolic ritual and the sacrifice of what would be necessary to keep reminding them there is nothing I can do, there is nothing I can produce that will cover up the damage that is done. It is the beginning of the story of restoration of our dignity, of our character, and of our life. He says to them, you were once wearing aprons, but it says he made them tunics, which means shoulder right to knee, a full tunic. In fact, the same tunic is described when God dictates the kind of priestly garments that the Levites need to wear in the tabernacle. So he makes for them tunics out of skin. You see, God accepts and loves us no matter where he finds us. No matter if it's deep, deep in the pit of darkness and sin, or even if we just keep dabbling our toe and dipping our toe in in the pools, the cesspool of sin, God accepts us and loves us right where we are. And he accepts that we might have made these attempts, these foolhardy attempts to cover our shame with fig leaves or our other drugs of choice, but he is not going to leave us like that. We can resist him, but his will and his intention and his offer for us is for something better, something more. And so he doesn't let them stay covered in fig leaves. He gives them fur coats. And he says, this is just temporary too. This is only temporary until I can restore for you the robe of righteousness. God is not finished with the story yet. And to me, this points to the greatest cover-up in all of history, that Jesus, that God himself would demonstrate what it would cost to fashion for us the most beautiful robe, the most beautiful piece of fashion ever in eternity. It would cost pain, it would cost suffering, it would cost a a sacrificial substitute. I don't know how many of you think about fashion as a perpetual badge of shame. I think we often move on from that and look at fashion as, again, something to entice or delight us or communicate um, our individuality or identity. But fashion truly started off as a badge of shame. And if you have nothing in this life to wear but a simple tunic, just remember that you were in good company with your original parents, Adam and Eve in paradise. Now, when I Googled greatest cover-up in history, I was looking for, you know, maybe something about the KGB or the FBI and some sort of historical events. But when I Googled greatest cover-up, this is what I found. This is what the world says is a great cover-up. You have dark eye circles? No problem. Just slap some glitter on there. You've got a double chin? There's a scarf for that. In fact, even tattooing your loved one's name can now be covered up. But these are not the greatest cover-ups. Not even our Instagram filters, the greatest cover-up ever invented. Or the cleverness of people. This is one of my favorites. Someone texts, you like anyone? Yeah, you. Uh, I have a BF. That stands for boyfriend. So the correction comes immediately. Yeah, comma, you, question mark? Oh, got it, yeah, quick thinking. That's why you love text messages, because you can type that on the spot. So I would suggest to you that none of these are actually the best cover-ups in history. But we are reflecting today on the greatest cover-up that ever took place. 
It began in Eden, and throughout the series, we're going to study how it continued with Passover. It continued in the tabernacle, and it continued right until the Last Supper when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Jesus desires nothing more than to have us bought back so we could be brought back into his into a perfect relationship with him and into um, connection, face-to-face -face connection with our creator, our maker, our heavenly father. We know now we have the privilege of knowing the history that even Adam didn't know, which is that the one did come. He wasn't born as Cain or Abel or Seth or Noah, although we have several more foreshadowing of who Jesus would be in a lot of those biblical characters. But we know that he did come. He did fulfill the promise. And right now, right now, he is working on your robe. He is preparing a place for you in paradise. And he is looking forward to reuniting with you and embracing you and giving you a permanent garment for all eternity that you can wear with pride, knowing that this was not done by anything that, that we did or said, but it was bought for us by amazing grace, by the sacrifice of God's own son. And so I, my petition to you today is to say yes to Jesus because he is sufficient for everything. And when you say yes to Jesus, you can say no mo fomo. Thank you. In the New Testament, there was no church that was more generous than the Macedonian church. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, Paul tells us how their joy overflowed in rich generosity. The encouraging thing for us about this joy was the circumstances it came from. Paul explains that they were in the midst of severe trials and extreme poverty, and it was in these times that God gave them this overflowing joy that resulted in generosity. Trials and suffering couldn't shake these believers because they didn't care about stuff. Their secret was not what belonged to them, but who they belonged to. And every one of us will also face trials and sufferings at some point in our lives. And just like the Macedonians, we must decide who or what we will trust in when they do arise. So let's look at three truths that the Macedonian believers teach us that will help us obtain the same joy and generosity they had in their extreme poverty. First, nothing can shake the joy of the generous. Paul's description of the Macedonian state of affairs should not be taken lightly. Severe tests of affliction and extreme poverty. These circumstances were more than minor setbacks. Yet God gave them the joy to not only make it through, but to give generously in the process. Secondly, generosity flows from a heart of self-sacrifice, not self-preservation. The motivation of giving is not to give in order to get. Instead, just like the Macedonians, it begins with our surrender to God and flows from His joy as we trust in Him. And finally, biblical giving comes from grace, not the law. Tithe, or 10%, is the biblical starting point for giving. Jesus validated this in Matthew 23, but as the Macedonians showed us, their giving was a direct result of the joy they found in God's grace, not from an obligation to give. These verses model for us the response God is looking for when we look at our financial situation. Paul tells us that the Macedonians gave themselves first to the Lord, and in the same way we should approach our finances by first affirming or reaffirming our commitment to trust God's promises. And secondly, we are told the Macedonians gave. Their generosity was the proof of where their joy really came from. And in the same way, our giving echoes what our hearts are trusting in. What a beautiful service it has been this morning. It's just been so powerful and just a true experience of God's love. And the best part is it's not over yet. 
we're going to continue worshiping through giving. And as you will see, there are so many different ways that we can give here at OAC via the online website or the app. We can text or we collect the offering here in the pew. So at this moment, I would just like to invite our ushers forward as we offer up a word of prayer. Father God, you are just so amazing. And we just want to thank you this morning for giving us a glimpse of your love and your desire to step into our lives in such a profound and powerful way. You know, we have so little to offer God, but you just ask for our hearts. And the most wonderful thing is that we also have the opportunity to partner with you financially so that we can share this love that you desire to give to the world with everyone we meet in our community and those who come through these doors week by week. God, we just ask that you will take our offerings, that you will bless them and multiply them, and that they will go to serve your people and to just bring more love and hope and joy to this world, the same love and hope and joy that we experience through you. In your name we pray. Amen. try this there you go there you go so it's a new series and that means a new theme song and everyone got all excited so we're gonna jump up out of our seats and we are gonna sing the lion and the lamb because there is no god like our god he is mighty he is big he is powerful and today we are gonna sing it like we mean it because every word is true is that right
Welcome to OAC. Uh, please take a seat. Um, I am Aslan, and I am part of the live stream ministry, and I'm also invo involved in collegiate ministries here at OAC. Uh, we hope you've been blessed by joining us today, and whether that's in-house or online, like some of our friends from, yes, Germany, um, Lima District, Peru, Sherman, Saxony, Germany. Tell me if I'm saying that right, Sten. All right, thank you. Um, Vienna, Australia, or no, Austria. <laughs> uh, Liberty, New York, Mexico City, Mexico. Placentia Garden Grove, Los Angeles, California. Mountain View, California. And in Canada, Australia, no, what, sorry, oh my gosh. <laughs> in Canada, Mississauga, Ontario, Edmonton, Alberta, and here in BC, Victoria, Abbotsford, Surrey, Richmond, and Lower Mainland. Um, that's all Lower Mainland. <laughs> okay. Um, if so, if you want to wave to some of our online viewers after this, please feel free to stand in front of the camera and do so. Um, this is, if this is your first time to OAC, we'd like to get, you know, get to know you in seven minutes or less. Meet us in front of the piano and we have a gift for you, and we promise it won't take more than seven minutes. Visitors are also invited to stay for lunch downstairs. OACers, you're welcome to contribute to our visitor lunch by bringing a dish or helping with cleanup at any time. If you're seeking prayer, please meet Kai Linda in front of the organ or use the Connect feature of the OAC app. There are some upcoming events I'd like to invite you to. Uh, tonight, OAC's annual general meeting begins at 5.30 p.m. A lot of work takes place behind the scenes to keep our church operating. This is your chance to learn about the active ministries and future plans of the church. After the meeting, you can stick around to play games or listen to a music recital, and dinner is provided. Next Sabbath begins with a heritage sing at 9.15 a.m. in the chapel. Then our Pathfinder and Adventurer Clubs will be taking an active role during worship. We're so glad to see our kids taking responsibility for their church. We really appreciate their parents and adult mentors for volunteering their time. Please show your support by coming and encouraging them next weekend and be blessed. Um, before we dismiss, our pastor will offer a closing prayer. Thank you. I'm going. Also, I just want to uh, recognize um, we have some membership transfers that are happening, and I need to do an official reading for the church. So joining us is Karis uh, from Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire? Hertfordshire. Har Har oh, I said that totally wrong. Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire, UK. And, uh, sorry, that was terrible. Um, so she's joining us in, in membership transfer. And same with Liliana. Many of us know her as Lily or the Brazilian Lily. And uh, she's um, somewhere today? No? Oh, she's on holiday. That's right. So uh, a rare week where she is not here. But they're joining us. And as well, we are sad to see Heidi and Ivan Corsese's course says Corsesses, um, head to Church in the Valley, but they have a family connection there and they're getting involved in that church. So can I just see any everyone who affirms welcoming Karis and Lily? Thank you very much. Uh, that's terrific. So we're so glad. As you can see, before even becoming official members, they both of these uh, ladies have been essential, vital volunteers to our ministry. So we really appreciate that. I do hope you'll come and join us tonight at the AGM and maybe get inspired about how you would get involved in ministry. There'll be a lot of volunteer opportunities profiled. So definitely join us tonight. Let's just bow our heads uh, for one final closing prayer. Father God, we thank you that you fulfill these symbols of being the mighty lion, the all-powerful king, our restorer, our redeemer, our protector, our champion, our rescuer, 
all of these powerful attributes we ascribe to you. And yet you were also so humble, so loving that you did not count hanging on to your royal priesthood as something to be tightly gripped, but you gave it all up for our sake, taking on human skin, human shame, the venom of sin, so that we could be restored and join you um, in eternal paradise. We thank you for that. We love you. And may hearts and lives be changed as they digest that truth within their very deepest parts of their heart and souls. I pray and ask in your holy name. Amen. See you tonight.